Hi, good morning. Good morning, everyone. I think let's let's wait uh, maybe a minute or two. Sounds good. To start doing a little bit of a welcome stroke introduction yes uh, yes we want to do that uh, um, let me post the link on on the chat for the notes and uh, we can do a stand-up right so 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 yeah, please add yourself on the on the attendance. And I think we can start. So who wants to go first? Do you want virtual COVID to present? <laughs> Yeah, perfect, Ria. Okay, um, I'll go ahead and start then. Um, hi guys, my name's Ria Batia. I'm part of Microsoft and I've been part of Virtual Coolit since the inception of the project. Um, so yeah, we were surprised that we were gonna present to you guys. Or it's also nice because I know the TUC has so many things to do. So it's cool that um, now Sigret, there's a thing called SIG Runtime and um, we can kind of filter all our discussions through you guys because um, yeah, we really want to see this project move forward. It's been in sandboxing for now, since it's been in sandbox since November, 2018. So um, we're kind of ready to move it forward and see it grow into incubation. Um, so yeah, I have a little PowerPoint that I'm going to present. Let me go ahead and share my screen. This works. Uh, yeah, I think first we want to uh, 
Oh. Uh, everybody else to kind of just kind of. Oh, an introduction? Say, oh, yeah, I'm say sorry. hi. <laughs> okay. worry. Yeah, worry. I'm sorry. That was, yeah. um, that's me. <laughs> yeah. So I'm uh, Ricardo, I'm a co-chair, so I, I don't have any updates. We have a roadmap to talk about a little bit later, so after your presentation. Uh, yeah, and I think, uh, Qu Quinton, you want to say anything? Or? Yeah, uh, hi, am I unmuted here? Yes, I am. Uh, I'm Quinton, uh, I'm also a co-chair here, uh, and I've been involved in the TOC pretty much, or rather the CNCF pretty much since the beginning, and was on the TOC for a while. Uh, and yeah, uh, just here to help where I can. Um, I, think I might actually have co-sponsored virtual cuplet uh, back in the day, if I remember correctly. I don't quite. Remember. <laughs> I think so. You might still be our co-sponsor. <laughs> cool. uh, Jeff. Yep, Jeff Holland from Microsoft. I'm one of the Kata maintainers. Uh, just dialing in to to listen and, and see what's new. No, no uh, agenda items for me. Okay, great. Uh, Eric? Eric uh, Cardi? Hey, okay, sorry, can you hear me now? Yeah. Yeah, sorry. Um, so yeah, my name is Eric Cardi. I'm somebody who's just been, um, you know, uh, I guess now lurking around the Kubernetes ecosystem for a bit, saw this new SIG, um, you know, was interested in container runtimes, been following, you know, some of the other um, projects as well from Kata to Nabla. And yeah, just sorry about my kids in the background. But yeah, um, just, you know, excited to learn more and see what, yeah, it's um, the roadmap for the SIG. Great. Uh, uh, Brendan? Yeah, hi, my name is Brendan. I uh, work at a company called Elotal. We're currently using Virtual Kubelet uh, for our uh, one of our products and uh, have been working in the conformance space with Rhea on um, seeing how conformant we can get our uh, provider. So yeah, that's pretty much it. Great. Uh, and Velmos? Yeah, maybe uh, maybe hush. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's very much. Uh, hi, uh, I'm also with Ilotl. I work with uh, Brandon uh, on the same project. So uh, right now we are working on a virtual kubelet provider. Awesome. Uh, and uh, Philip, Philip Rogan. Philip. Oh, sorry, you cannot hear me, I was on mute. <laughs> Hi, so Philip from Arm. I'm uh, also joining, interested in tracking the activity and roadmap here, coming from, from the Arm side. I also am interested in the uh, multi-architecture support generally for, for the projects involved here. Perfect. Uh, Klaus, you want to say anything? Any updates? Uh, no, hello, everyone. Uh, this is Klaus. Um, uh, do the match so far so good. <laughs> yeah, so you got a sponsor for your volcano, so I think. Uh... Yes, yeah, so we got uh, one sponsor for volcano right now, and uh, we are trying to get more. The other two sponsor. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Yeah. And Diane. Hi, I'm Diane Fatima. I work for Red Hat in the CTO office, and I work primarily on AI and ML, and so I'm uh, and I volunteer to be a co-chair. Uh, so I'm mostly interested in runtimes that, you know, involve AI and ML, but, uh, here to just help out. Great. Um, I, I can, I never can spell your last name correctly. So sometimes I, I do two D's and sometimes I, I do two M's. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's a funny Dutch name. Yeah. Um, okay. So. Anybody else? I think that we got everybody. Okay, cool. So I think the next item on the agenda is just a virtual kubelet uh, presentation, so. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so we can. Go now. <laughs> um, all right, let me present my screen. Yeah. Let's see if this works. Okay, can you see my screen? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, perfect. 
Um, yeah, so hi guys, I'm a virtual Kumbulet core maintainer. Um, so yeah, let's just, I have a lightweight PowerPoint. Um, a lot of our links are in the PR that we have um, in the CNCF project. Um, but I just want to start the discussion and kind of see what we need to do to get to the status, to incubation status. That's kind of the goal for, for us today. Um, okay, so introduction to virtual Kubelet for folks that don't really know about it. Um, it was created in December 2017. We moved to the CNCF as a sandbox project in November um, 2018. And the so the way that virtual Kubelet works is we basically create we decided to kind of create a kubelet that doesn't actually need a node to survive. Um, the main point of it was we wanted to be able to have an abstraction that didn't rely on a node um, so we could get closer and closer to basically packaging up workloads within a pod rather than thinking about pods and then how you fit that within nodes. Um, we had some customers within Azure itself that were particularly interested in that because we had a product called Azure Container Instances, but they were also interested in how to scale, how to load balance, um, and how to do a bunch of the other things that Kubernetes already did. So instead of reinventing the wheel, well, we decided to make a simpler version of what the Kubelet could be. Um, and so it gave us a lot more flexibility into Kubernetes and allowed us to really decide what it meant when um, you get a pod in Kubernetes, you get the pod status. Um, there's a couple of things that we didn't really need like capacity for a node um, or like, but we did need capacity in the sense for the workload and that's how you understood how much the pod really spun out to. Um, so yeah, so that's why we decided to create it. And after that, we were also um, working with a company called HyperSH. That company no longer exists, but um, they, a lot of them are kind of now around, um, whether it's in Alibaba or other places or Microsoft. Um, and they're, some of them are still kind of working on the project. Um, past that, we also got more people involved. So there's a lot more providers now today since when we released. When we released, we really just um, created this virtual Kubelet interface and then we created a concept of a provider. So any person or company or organization that felt like they could create a pod, get a pod, delete it, possibly update it, um, they could be part of virtual Kubelet. Um, and it might only be a few lines of code. So that was kind of powerful for people to get um, get their abstractions into a uh, virtual Kubelet. And we did something after we, when we released 1.0 um, and before that, um, we also did something in play that we split out our providers from the core virtual Kubelet project. Um, and that's important because now providers can kind of live on their own while virtual Kubelet continues to improve on its own. Before they were kind of stuck together. So when we released, we released everything. So every provider went out at once. Um, we've done that now um, at 1.0, which is really, really, really important because now we don't really have to keep track of providers and they're allowed to do what they need to on their own. But we created a governance policy for providers so we can support them within the project, but it's more like us supporting them as an organization rather than through a release process. Um, so yeah. So some stats, we have five core maintainers um, for virtual Kubelet and one core maintainer, which has, um, I don't know, graduated or not, <laughs> he's, he's there, but he's not part of the core maintainer status anymore. Um, so we, we have companies from like Netflix, Microsoft, VMware. We have someone from another company that doesn't want to be named from that company. Um, so that's cool. <laughs> and then we have 10 project maintainers. So this is that provider um, situation that I was talking about before. We have every project or provider has their own repo within Virtual Kubelet itself. And we ask that there's one to two people from that provider that list out their names, give us their emails, and they're kind of the point of contact for that. So we call them project maintainers. Um, we've done 33 releases. Uh, we're currently on v1.1.1, which released on December 2nd. We have monthly office hours. It used to be like weekly, then it was bi-weekly. But now that virtual kubelet, the interface itself is stabilized and we don't see a lot of new feature work. It's more like maintenance work and kind of 
working with the community through GitHub, um, we decided that monthly office hours like worked better, especially since we have Slack and we're accessible through GitHub. Um, and this project's been going on for now like three years. <laughs> um, so yeah, and then eight official providers in the repo and then five unofficial providers that we know about. Um, so these are like the IoT Edge provider. Um, this is kind of like Eodel's provider, Netflix's provider, VMware's provider. Um, and then I think there was one more, which I'm forgetting, but these are just the ones that we know about. People have the ability to go in and kind of, if they want to fork it, they can, um, and create their own provider. Or a lot of people are just using this in private in their own companies. Um, and it's just, it's sometimes difficult to, for us to know about it. Um, even if they create an issue, we don't exactly know what company they're coming from. Um, but yeah, this is what we know so far um, and always open to figuring out more. So progress since our sandbox entry, um, we released 1.0 um, about, I think it's been a year now since that, or not, sorry, not a year, but like, you know, the new year. Um, we've gained momentum and contributors across the industry. Netflix is uh, a pretty huge one. We worked really, really closely with them to get to 1.0 um, because there was a lot of things that they needed for their project to move forward. They're actually using it for Titus. So they built, um, Netflix built out Virtual Kubelet on top of Mesos. So they have an entire Mesos infrastructure, um, but they wanted their developers and their, in, their entire company basically of compute, they have their own compute notion, um, to move with Kubernetes. Um, so to get that API, they created um, Virtual Kubelet and anytime they need like a Virtual Kubelet node or whatever, it's actually spinning out to their Mesos um, underlays. So that's really interesting, the way that they created that flexibility. It's not open sourced um, today, but there's a really, really good talk that we did at last, the last KubeCon um, around what Netflix is doing with Titus. So if you guys wanna learn more and kind of understand what they're doing, they went really, really in depth at our last, so it's the virtual Kubelet um, intro session, the last KubeCon. So go ahead and check that out. Um, so we split out the providers, we out of tree, now we're in maintenance mode, um, and we've done a lot, a lot of talks. We've done talks with HashiCorp, VMware, Netflix, um, any partner that we've had, um, and any maintainer really, um, which has been awesome. Okay, so our virtual, I really want to kind of set the stage um, to focus on providers, because I think that's the greatest point of tension for us at least, because every provider has the flexibility to do what they want with the interface that we provide within virtual kubelet core um, and that's why things like conformance um, and things like understanding what even the deployment would look like for customers we have an understanding within like azure for example for what it should what the customer experience is and we kind of hold that to a, a high standard um, and everybody else has the ability to and the flexibility to figure out what that um, experience looks like. Um, so that's why when it's hard and we talk about the virtual cool project in general, um, we've enabled a couple things and it's up to the providers to go further, like enable networking, enable volume support, um, and things like that. So this is our definition for them. Um, it's to provide the backend pl plumbing necessary to support the, support the lifecycle management of pods, containers, um, and supporting resources in the context of Kubernetes. Um, they must conform to the current API by virtual kubelet. Um, and they must kind of write their provider in a way that it doesn't have access to the API server and it's a well-defined callback me mechanism for getting data back like secrets um, and config maps. So we, we put a lot of responsibility on the provider this way. Um, they must, we create the methods for them, like we have the place where they create a pod, update a pod, get pod status, and we, we help reconcile all of that. Um, but they really must, they're the ones that have to figure out how to spin out to whatever abstraction they're trying to spin out to, whether it's ACI, um, whether it's Mesos, whether it's, I don't know, Pizza Hut, like you can really create a pod and make that pod do whatever you want. Um, it could turn on your lights, it, it just coats, so it could really do anything. Um, so they must figure out how to, what it means to create a pod, update a bot, pod, get pod status, get pods, get node conditions. Uh, a little, it gets a little wonky there. <laughs> um, the operating system, whether it's Linux, Windows, or et cetera. Um, 
these are things that Kubernetes exposes and we allow providers to also expose the same things um, within virtual kubelet. Um, no daemon pod endpoints, delete pod, um, and then environment variables config maps. No, for example, no one's done like no daemon pod endpoints, um, DNS names and more. So in ACI, we created um, our own notion of networking. It doesn't go through Kubernetes networking, but it does, I mean, it works through Kubernetes, but in our backend, the way that we do it is completely different from what you'd expect in a node in a cluster. But for our customers, it looks basically seamless, um, which was our goal within Azure itself. Um, and so these are kinds of the things that every provider has to go through um, to build out that experience. This is what the interface looks like. So super simple. Um, that, this is what we kind of hand off to people, to providers. Um, and then adopters that are in production usage. So these are the ones that we just know about and there's tenfold more um, just because a lot of these are cloud, we're like cloud providers, for example, right? And we have a lot of customers that we're tracking internally that we can't exactly talk about, but that are there. Um, and I know like VMware, um, not VMware, but Amazon also has them. They have virtual Google as kind of more an experimental project, but I'm sure there's some people using them. Um, so Netflix, Alibaba, Azure, VMware, and Edel. I put an asterisk because their stuff isn't, um, I don't know if it's done yet, so, um, but they're working on it. And then there's so many more that are not public um, just because of our relationship between providers and then that it's like a two degree process to get to end users specifically, um, the way that we've seen virtual Kubla grow. And then I'm gonna hand it off to Brendan to talk through conformance testing. Yeah, so uh, I work at Alodal, like like I said before, and when we present our uh, provider at conferences, we got a lot of questions of, well, how conformant is it with Kubernetes? And so we started looking into this, and um, at the beginning, I thought, well, since Virtual Kubelet is a library, essentially, that we can use to build providers, um, conformance is something that is very much provider specific. So these numbers really only apply to our provider. Uh, somebody's uh, ACI's providers conformance might be different because they implement things on the back end very differently. So, um, but what we wanted to show that is that you can create a prov provider that is close to conformant and uh, we're hoping to create a provider that gets us as close as possible to 100% conformance. Um, and so we've been running the uh, conformance tests using Sono Buoy, like the, the official conformance uh, uh, framework. And you can see from these numbers here uh, that we've, we're doing pretty good uh, in, in terms of, well, uh, we're about 73, 74% conformant and we can use the uh, conformance suites to identify areas where we need to apply engineering effort and either implement that in our provider or push it up into, into virtual kubelet, which we're looking forward to do. Uh, some of the places where we're, our provider is weak, for example, is in the support of downward API. There's a lot of downward APIs end-to-end um, -end tests, so um, we're hoping to get those pushed back up into virtual kubelet uh, for anyone to use and uh, help out the other providers essentially uh, in supporting those, that functionality. So um, yeah, uh, Virtual Kubelet's made it really easy to actually get our product out. And uh, right now, uh, just as a note, uh, we are not open source as of today. We hope that changes literally tomorrow. Uh, so uh, looking forward to that. Um, yeah, uh, like I said, uh, Conformance is going up every week or so for us. Uh, and we're able to use the conformance tests to really push those numbers up and ensure that our product in most areas works exactly like something, uh, your pods will work exactly like they work on a regular kubelet. I think that touches on everything. Um, I'll hand it back to Rhea. Cool, thank you. And we're getting towards the end here, so.
can be done, I think, in a second. Um, here's an example for what people have to add to their um, pod deployments or their deployments in general um, to get to spin out to virtual kubelet for at least Azure. Um, so we use tolerations and taints, and if you have the, the right key, you're able to spin out to virtual kubelet. We don't automatically spin out anybody to virtual kubelet. So when you create a um, create a deployment and you're within AKS or just AKS engine or something else, um, and you have virtual kubelet, we will never automatically spin you out just because it, the vir virtual kubelet is different. And so if not everything, if you haven't tailored your deployment for what works, like you don't have daemon sets, you don't have um, maybe specific metrics or things like that, um, we're never going to do that. It's always a user choice. And that's very explicit. That's the recommendation we give to everybody. It's user specific. They need to understand what they're doing here. Um, and then the way if people want to fill up their nodes, for example, and they do have a deployment that does want to spin out to virtual kubelet eventually for a burst scenario, um, that's when they could go in and do like node affinities and basically they're able to spin out to virtual kubelet if things are if things happen. Um, and that's the way that we end up doing it. So, so yep, yeah, um, that's basically it from my side. Um, we didn't go too in depth on use cases, um, and that's because we've probably talked about use cases for now like two to three years. I'm happy to go through use cases in this um, forum again, um, but a lot of it boils down to burst use cases, flexibility, um, easily like billing by. Um, the resources that customer use, customers use rather than um, a big bucket of resources. And um, and yeah, for providers, it's a, a lot about that flexibility and being able to kind of, a lot of people are using um, virtual kubelet to mesh their current infrastructure with Kubernetes because they have all this old infrastructure and they want to continue to use it. It works well, but they want their organization to move forward in terms of how they develop and how they deploy workloads. Um, in that life cycle and they see the industry moving towards Kubernetes. And so virtual Kubelet gave them a nice middle ground where they don't have to completely overthrow everything, um, but they still are able to use Kubernetes with the stuff they with the stuff that they like, that they've built at least. Um, and so we've seen a lot of that too. Um, and yeah, so I'll hand it over to y'all <laughs> to say runtime. Uh, Great. Um, so any questions? Any, uh, I have a question because I'm, this is the first time I've really seen this. I need to go watch those videos from KubeCon that were, that we recommended. But um, so like for node affinity with this, is that mostly for like debugging? People can see what node they actually ran on if there's like a problem or how does, how is that used? Um, it's not specifically for a problem. Wow, it's been so long since I've deployed <laughs> node affinities. Um, the way I remember using it was for when I wanted to spill over to virtual kubelet. So basically we said that like um, only if virtual kubelet, like there is a certain thing, it only if virtual kubelet, the other nodes reach capacity basically, then you're allowed to spill over to, to the virtual kubelet node. So that's the way that we used it. I'm sure there's other ways. Um, that folks can use it. Okay, so node affinity doesn't mean, in, in my idea of node affinity is I say, I need this to run on this particular physical hardware. Yeah, we did prefer scheduling, but ignore during execution. So we have a different, that is usually what it, it's, <laughs> it's used for, um, but we have a different tag underneath that like, don't do it unless there's this exception. Okay. Yeah, Sounds it's cool. weird. It's a weird thing to get your head wrapped around, but um, it's kind of the way that we finagled Kubernetes to work for us. Um, but this is just for spillover situations. Okay. So if you do want to know where you actually ran, which hardware you actually ran on, can you, is there a way of finding that out? Oh, like down to where, like the, um, so this is up to the provider. So virtual kubelet will expose the the node so we will expose the cpu we will expose some sort of node capacity but usually it's ridiculous usually it's like three terabytes um and like x whatever for cpu um so it's not very realistic but we do have an there is a place where we finagle kubernetes again to say like when you when you talk about the os that's where you can put linux or windows etc you could expose the actual capacity 
through Kubernetes if you wanted to, but usually on the back end, we've seen a lot of providers have larger pools of resources. Um, but if you wanted to specifically tie in your back end to your front end, you could do that. Um, Kubernetes lets you do that already, and Virtual Kubelet would also allow you to do that, but it's up to the provider how a lot of providers have multiple machines behind that one um, virtual kubelet. So okay. they kind of They're, make it more vague. They have to implement that if they want that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. No problem. Thanks. I have a question. So you mentioned that uh, um, in terms of uh, people migrating to Kubernetes or using this uh, to replicate more of their, uh, what it would look like running Kubernetes, right? So, but what, are there any other use cases for people who, um, you know, have already decided to move uh, to Kubernetes and they have all of their infrastructure in Kubernetes, right? So, um, even going forward, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so for folks that already have all their infrastructure, um, a lot of folks, so um, when we think about larger organizations, we think about people that have, and we can talk about a smaller use case too, but for folks that have larger, larger inter enterprises or companies, a lot of folks have their own compute notion within their team. So these are the folks, and we've seen this all over, where people are building out teams specifically just for Kubernetes. Um, so they're building out infrastructure, like their infrastructure ops teams or whatever. And those are the folks that touch Kubernetes. When you're, they're looking at lots of ways to abstract away Kubernetes for their users, for their users meaning their internal developers and um, app operators, et cetera. And this kind of using virtual kubelet as an abstraction reduces the overhead of trying to understand all of the intricacies of their nodes and how they're scheduling out and like fixing node errors um, when you could just abstract it with virtual kubelet and kind of We've seen even in Alibaba, what they do is they end up giving giving each um, team within their. I I don't want to talk about the specifically which team we're using this in, but they basically give out one virtual kubelet per team. So instead of holding X amount of nodes, if nothing's running, nothing's running. They don't get like X amount of capacity. Um, so instead, they give out a virtual kubelet and they're like spin out to virtual kubelet when you have workloads, but. And this will get distributed across their entire company because now they can represent Kubernetes um, clusters as like, they don't have to represent a cluster per team. Now they're representing a virtual kubelet per team and that cluster could fly anywhere and it could res resemble X amount of capacity, but they don't care about that. They don't need to care about that. Um, and so they don't have to think about node errors, cluster errors, that's up to another team to figure that out. And if something happens, um, they'll automatically move over workloads. So they can move to a different um, virtual kubelet, but uh, behind virtual kubelet, usually there's X amount of nodes. So like they have the flexibility to kind of really do some cool stuff um, and get their clusters to um, crazy amounts of utilization. Great, thanks. Mm -hmm. any, any, any other questions? Yeah, I, I still have a, a kind of a, gap in my understanding here. So, so baked into all sorts of parts of the Kubernetes API is this concept of a node. So you can, for example, request that containers be on different nodes or the same node. Uh, and that has, you know, specific meanings and all the load balancing is sort of across parts, but uh, there's routing between these things. Um, and, mm -hmm. and all of the downward API stuff you mentioned is all sort of downward to the node. <clears throat> um, so I'm, I'm, I'm sort of curious how th this concept of a node is so baked into the Kubernetes API. Um, you can't sort of wave your hands and just make it go away as far as I can tell, but I'm, I'm curious how all of that stuff actually works. Like for example, auto, auto scaling, presumably, I mean, it, it deals with the concept of nodes and you're running out of nodes and you need to scale them up. I presume all that stuff doesn't work either. Yeah. <laughs> so as I wish Brian was here. So he's our kind of, I would say, engineer on the project um, who would be able to go through all of that with you. I don't know where he is right now, but um, I'm going to give it my best shot from a from basically a user and more like PM centric view of what's going on here. Um, what we do is we basically do our best to 
we fault towards if things work in Kubernetes, we want it to look like Kubernetes as much as possible. So when you're, things, when you're thinking about things like auto scaling and you're thinking about things like load balancing, as much as possible at the surface layer, they look the same to the user in the way that the user would describe these things in pod deployment. So the way that you describe auto, auto scaling, et cetera, is the same, but you still have to, even when you have like, if you have multiple kinds of nodes in your cluster, that's why we have node affinities. That's why we have taints and tolerations. So folks are able to kind of pick which nodes they want things to run on, right? Um, with that notion, we do the same thing. So we treat virtual kubelet as a node from the user's standpoint. It's just what's happening on the background. Um, like that doesn't get exposed to the user at all. So it does look like just a node in Kubernetes. The way, the how, and you're asking like, how do we do this? That's a very good question. Um, I didn't write any of that code. And I would love if anyone, Brendan, if you want to jump in or if someone else wants to jump in exactly how go for it. Yeah, uh, it's an expansive question and one that we've actually worked with uh, throughout all of our work on our provider at least. So just to give you a quick background, our provider, when you submit a, when a pod gets dispatched to the virtual kubelet, our provider spins up uh, a virtual machine in the cloud in the background and your container is run on that virtual machine actually. Um, so in order to make that work, uh, for example, the downward API, the plan is there. Well, once the machine comes up, we, when dispatching the pod to the machine to run there, we'll overwrite environment variables or create environment variables that have the specs of that machine. So your container, uh, or your pod running on that virtual machine. Thanks. Sorry, oh. sorry. I, don't, I just want to interrupt you quickly. I, I understand all that stuff. Um, oh, okay. All right. What I don't understand is, I mean, th there are lots and lots of examples I can give, but but here's a basic one. Yeah. So I launch a uh, deployment and I say that I want each of the pods in the deployment on a different node. Yeah. Okay. Kubernetes scheduler then tries to do that. Yes. But actually, there's no ways that the Kubernetes scheduler can do that, and there's no way in the API that the virtual kubelet can do that either. So that very basic function there's doesn't a, appear to work. And this yeah, it. well, we have a taint on virtual kubelet, so you won't like the the scheduler will understand not to schedule that to virtual kubelet until there's that toleration in your pod spec, and then it will go and see so that. There is a toleration. So let's let's assume what what I want as a user is yeah. I have. I have a bunch of capacity to run containers, right? And right now, unbeknown to me, and I don't really care, uh, it's living in a virtual kubelet. So it's living in Azure container, or whatever it's called. And all I want to do is run my pretty standard deployment that says don't run these pods on the same machine, just run them mm -hmm. all on different nodes. Um, and yes, my administrator told me that I have to put this magic incantation to allow my stuff to run on on virtual kubelet, um, but actually there's no way that I can understand that that, that request can be uh, actually fulfilled because the Kubernetes scheduler can't schedule it onto different nodes. It can only, it only knows about one virtual kubelet node, so it can't actually schedule them onto different nodes. And it has no way of passing that information through to the virtual kubelet to make sure they end up on different nodes. And, and like I said, there, there seem to be a like, hundreds of other examples I could conjure up where, where stuff like yeah. pretty basic stuff just can't work. So that's I mean I'm that's to. that's basic in the mindset of you're using Kubernetes with multiple nodes. Like it depends on your cluster. If you wanted to have a multiple node cluster with a virtual kubelet, I mean you could technically do that. If that's your if that's what you want for your organization, you could do that. Virtual kubelet is really the way that users will use it and do use it is very specified and they have a really good reason for why they want to spin out to virtual kubelet. It's usually not because they want to run multiple things on multiple nodes. That notion goes away completely. Like that's not even a thing you would think about in this world, a virtual kubelet, um, that I need to run multiple workloads across X amount of nodes. We are looking at things like if you want to be fault taught like if you want to make sure that you're you have high availability etc 
that's really up to the back end and the provider to provide that in another way. And those are still use cases that we're working towards. Um, for example, ACI would probably already do that. Um, but in this scenario, like, why would you want to run things on multiple nodes, I guess, is the crux of the question. And can we solve that rather than can we solve the problem of running multiple things like the same pod and multiple nodes in Kubernetes. Like instead, let's look at the use case and drive yeah, towards so that. That's, that's perfectly valid. So, so ideally what one should tell Kubernetes is run this deployment in HA mode, for example. Yeah, and, exactly. And it would then translate that into run it on, on multiple nodes. But, but even if that is the case, there is no way in Kubernetes to do that today. So, so actually, there's no way to do it in Kubernetes, but we could actually finagle that within virtual kubelet because we can, we can, we're able to just to take in different parameters. It'd be really wonky, and we haven't done that. For, we haven't okay, done so that. We're just talking about the like theoretical use cases. My question is, um, we yeah. would be able to do that actually. Um, we could give users that, like, if we did that in ACI or Yodel's provider or something. Um, we could use an environment variable or something like that to express that you want. A high availability like set for this you want it to be i don't know times three to make sure it goes on three different machines um and we would do that in the back end and when what you would see in the front end like we could also finagle that you could see three pods running and maybe each machine it's tied to something different like there's a lot that we could do in this world um it is a, a weird place of like half your serverless half your not um but people are working through it. And basically my, my standpoint, just being a corporate core maintainer, um, I care about all the providers kind of getting towards the goals that they have for their end users. And that's why virtual Kubelet is so flexible and so simple at its core um, is to provide for any of these kinds of use cases. And every time we do a talk at KubeCon, we get a million questions not really like yours, but more like, <laughs> what if I wanted to put a virtual kubelet on a satellite? Like, what if I wanted to spin out, like use Kubernetes as my control plane for all of these different kinds of machines across um, my home or my business, or et cetera. It's the, the creativity of people just kind of gets up leveled with this project. And I think that's something really amazing. Um, and yeah, it doesn't exactly work with Kubernetes, but that's why we're not going towards Kubernetes. Like this is a CNCF. Or within the CNCF, we're not trying. Like we are trying to conform with Kubernetes. Hold on, sorry. Let me interrupt but... you quickly. I, I have. <laughs> yeah. Do you <laughs> so get the, what I'm saying? <laughs> the fundamental premise. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, and 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 uh, I'm I'm just trying to uh, clarify my confusion here. So the yeah. fundamental premise here is you have some other uh, container orchestrator, uh, be it Mesos or Azure Container Service or anything else, and users want a Kubernetes interface to it. That, that is sort of the, uh, they want the functionality of Kubernetes and the API. That, that seems to be a fundamental uh, premise of this project. <clears throat> and you're saying we're not moving towards Kubernetes and, and we've also identified that, that quite a large swathe of the Kubernetes API does not actually work. Um, and that you need to do things differently than they're done in Kubernetes in order to achieve them when you're running on a virtual kubelet, for example, HA. So that the mechanisms that Kubernetes provides for HA, like uh, node affinity, uh, saying I don't want my containers on the same node because I don't want them to fail at the same time, doesn't work. Um, so I guess, well, <laughs> like, what are we left with if, if we set out to create an Kubernetes We're, API on top of a different container orchestrator and the Kubernetes API substantially doesn't work, what do we have? Um, that's a strange way to look at it too. Um, so basically like virtual kubelet isn't boiling the ocean with what it can do. It understands who it is. It understands that it's providing burst workloads. It's providing an abstraction. Providers can implement those things if they feel like they need those for their end users. Like, Netflix can go ahead and implement whatever they need for the API and it's working for them today um, to make sure that their workloads are spun out the way they need to. But they're using, like Netflix is currently using this because they have virtual kubelet. They're using Kubernetes, they're using the API because they were given the ability with this project to get the flexibility they needed for their infrastructure. Um, 
saying that Kubernetes is the end all for everybody's intra is just not going to be, and the entire API even, maybe it's not just what all end users need, um, but we are like, we're doing our best to make sure if a customer or if a user or if a provider needs a certain functionality, we will work through it and figure it out. It's like a day by day basis. We're not saying that we know we're doing everything Kubernetes can do, but the things that you're talking about with no tolerations, like we can still do those. If you have, um, for example, if you have a special like GPU enabled node, there's some workloads you don't want to run on that, right? On that node, you're going to save it off for the specialized workloads. That's exactly what we're saying virtual Kubla is. Think of it as a different kind of OS or a different kind of operating system where you know it's only for special things and you're not going to schedule Linux workloads if it's a Windows node. Like, think of it in that premise. Um, and then I think things become a little bit more clear that you can still use all of those notions that we have in Kubernetes. Um, and yeah, like downward API doesn't work, but we, if we feel a need to do it and we've only seen a need actually within conformance, like we will go and implement it. But um, I guess what I'm asking for is like, is the core premise of virtual kubelet, what we're doing here today, is that enough? Are we debating like the core premise of virtual kubelet or are we debating what we need to get virtual kubelet towards incubation? Cause we're already in the CNCF. Um, so I'm trying to figure out like how we can get to incubation, I guess. And if it's making those work, this, those specific use cases that we hold as virtual kubelet more clear, I thought they, I mean, we leave it super flexible for a provider. So it's really for the providers to go and provide those use cases. But, um, yeah, I'm just trying to figure out like what we can do, I guess. So yeah. So, so I was the one who sponsored or one of the ones who sponsored uh, virtual kubelet into the sandbox initially. And the, the reason that that was done was, and I did this in consultation with Brendan Burns at the time, I seem to recall. Um, so the, the, the reason I thought it was a good idea was to explore the concept of how do we remove the, the concept of node from Kubernetes? Um, because it is a, I mean, Virtual Kubelet is not the only project that wants to do away with the concept of nodes because they are problematic. Um, and as you've pointed out, there are other ways, you know, because you provide nodes, people say, well, put my stuff on different nodes when actually what they mean is make it highly available, etc. And so there are a myriad of reasons why it is a good idea to remove the concept of nodes from Kubernetes, um, from the API, um, and, and achieve, you know, try and achieve the same aims by different purposes, or, or the, the same aims with different mechanisms. And so so that was the intention of putting virtual kubelet into the sandbox was to to come up with an answer to that question can we remove the node concept from kubernetes and and have it a useful kind of abstraction and and that seemed like a very useful exploration to be done in the sandbox um it superficially and, and I'm still not clear like what part of Kubernetes does work and what part doesn't work. We've, we've got some conformance uh, percentages and those are useful, uh, but we also know that conformance only covers a relatively small portion of the Kubernetes API. So, so we really need to understand like as a, user, a, a normal user of Kubernetes, like how much of it actually works if I, if, if I run it on a, on a virtual kubelet and how much just simply doesn't work anymore. I mean, that that's going to be different. up to each provider to do that, right? Like depending on the, the providers and the, what functionality they make, they make on a daily basis, like it's very up to them and how they explain that to their users. A lot of them, they understand it's slightly different from the, what they're going to get from a normal Kubernetes node. Um, and it, so what my, question is how do we do that if like conformance is the way to figure out what's in kubernetes right and that was kind of our programmatic way to figure that out how do we go back and like answer that question of what works because today we're saying this is a subset for each provider that works today this is our functionality but we're not going through and saying all of this doesn't work um and that we haven't seen a need even for that um i don't know i Yeah, it, yeah, it's I, definitely I a question that. I want to I want to answer. It just seems like it's going to take. I, has anyone else done that that we can go off of? Done what? Sorry. 
gone through everything in Kubernetes past conformance to figure out what does work and what doesn't. And I don't know how to express that. Um, in the I way think the windows works. provide a, so, so the comment Brian Grant made in the PR, uh, which is that the windows people had, had similar problems. Um, they wanted to support windows containers. Um, uh, Patrick, I think was the main person there. And, uh, and so they had to go through the whole of Kubernetes and figure out like which, which parts of it work when I'm using a Windows container and which parts of it don't. Okay, and would you want us to do that per provider? Say again? Would you want us to do that per provider then? Um, I, I'm not, I mean, I, I understand that, that you can't vouch for any given provider's implementation of the interface, but I, I think the interface itself fundamentally limits a certain amount of stuff I mean, presumably you have a kind of a reference implementation of a provider at the moment. And there's also certain limitations that the interface itself creates. Um, if there's no way to um, allow the Kubernetes scheduler to do anything than schedule a pod onto this large group of, con of nodes that are sort of hidden underneath the virtual kubelet, there's a whole class of things in Kubernetes that don't work. It kind of doesn't matter who the provider is, that that functionality is not available in the in the API in the virtual kubelet API. Okay. So, so that so I think that's the kind of and that's what Brian Grant asked for. I think a long time ago, maybe in October. I, I don't remember exactly when his mm -hmm. comment came in, but what he wants us to do is understand what works and what doesn't work to the same level of detail as the Windows Container Group. Did. That's the thing. We can't do it to the same level of detail unless we're doing a per provider. Like our interface is so simplistic. We could copy and paste the interface in that and describe every, like all the methods we have. Um, but that wouldn't be super useful for anybody because you can go and go to GitHub page and look at our interface and see what we support. Um, I think. Like, but you could do it for one provider, right? You could do huh? it for your reference. You, you could do it for one provider, for example, your reference provider, perhaps the Azure one. I'm not sure which one is the ref is the sort of yeah, the one um, that exercises the API the best. Or, right now or we're any doing it through EODL's provider and we were going to do kind of like a write up on what that meant. And that's kind of, and we we're going to do it in the format that Windows wanted, um, that, that Windows had before. Um, and let, that's something we can definitely do. Um, is Okay, yeah, and if that's it, then that's, that makes sense. Um, it's just that doing it per <laughs> provider. It's just like, the reason I'm saying this is like, it doesn't make a lot of sense from the virtual Kubelet perspective because every end, like it doesn't make sense for end users because every end user is using a different provider. So going through Yodel's, going through any, like just Azure or just Yodel, It'll sure it'll give you some sort of sense that like almost everything can kind of work, but like it's so specific per provider that we're not going to be getting what an end user would be looking for. Like my, I understand. Yeah, yeah, I understand. And that's why I would ask us to look at this from a different perspective and look at Virtual Kubelet's core and what we offer there, but think of it in a different way instead of conformance. Like, can we do that? Because we're still like, and I'm going to get back to this, like we're not part of the Kubernetes project. Like, and there was a reason we did that because we were so different from Kubernetes. So is there a different set of ideals that virtual Kubelet can make as a project, understanding that we're meshing in two different infrastructures, whether it's Mesos, whether it's ACI, whether it's something else to Kubernetes, like I, we're bringing the value of Kubernetes to everybody, but the way that we do it is slightly different to for end users. So I'm just asking if we can like, because we can write up that documentation. I have no problem doing it. I just don't think it's going to be useful for anybody other than us. What about doing what you suggested? Quentin said you know, there are certain things that just couldn't be implemented if you just documented what those are. Yeah, and we actually, we have a lot of that in our repo and like in our um, in our Google Drive and things like that. I can plop that up on a, a readme in Virtual Kubelet. We've done a lot of like, you, you can't do daemon sets. Um, again, if a provider decides to implement them, you can do daemon sets, um, but it will be, the notion will be different from what a Kubernetes user would expect. Um, you can't do private networking in some of the providers. You can in ACI. 
Like, it's just... Uh... I'd like to say that most providers do point out their shortcomings in their repos. Um, I regret that we're about 24 hours late in open sourcing ours, but we could point to exact uh, specifications of what we don't support at this time and what we do support so users can know that. Um, also, I just want to say that virtual kubelet is something that fundamentally does redefine what a node is in Kubernetes. And as a result of that, if, you, if you're redefining what a, node, what a node is and how a node behaves, I think that so, you're fundamentally, by the nature of doing that, you're breaking down the abstractions um, and certain things like node affinity. Well, what does that mean? Well, it means something to a regular Kubernetes cluster, but you're doing something specialized here because you couldn't get it out of Kubernetes originally. And so our whole point is like, yeah, you can, you can say node affinity doesn't work, but why would you even want to mess with node affinity in this type of system? You're building a specialized system using Kubernetes, and this is a building block that allows you to do that. Um, so if there are other examples there, I'd love to hear about them, but, um, uh, and yeah, we can talk more about that. Seems like node affinity would be useful for reproducibility. If you had some system you wanted to troubleshoot, you would want to know you want to re reproduce what happened and you want to know what node it actually ran on. Yeah, uh, I think that the much like a container, a lot of the back end uh, implementations are ephemeral. And so reproducing that, you can run the same thing, but you're never going to have things that are persistent after your container or pod uh, goes away. It is... Uh, it's a different way of looking at it, much like in serverless, for example. I think there are a lot of parallels there. You, you might run you know, a, a Lambda function in Amazon, but being able to run it again and reproduce something, well, you're probably going to be able to achieve that, but you can't get on to the you know, whatever backing instance that is and look around for what went wrong. Uh, does that make sense? Somewhat, yeah. I yeah. mean, ultimately, though, if there's a br something's broken, you're going to have to try to reproduce. Yeah, I think that you would just, uh, in our two and a half years of running a similar system, um, I would say that you run the pod again, you can, uh, and you troubleshoot it that way. Maybe you don't let it end, maybe you stop it before the failure, or you stop it after the failure and inspect things. Um, reproducibility comes out a little bit different in, uh, Fundamentally, a lot of this stuff that we're building is serverless systems, uh, whatever that might mean to you. And uh, so a lot of the guarantees of an old, we have the infrastructure, we can SSH into nodes just goes away uh, fundamentally. And that's a good thing, um, but it's a new way of working. Yeah, I think, I think this thing that's up on the screen in front of us here sort of summarizes my my question and then I'll leave it at that. So, so as a user, and I'm trying to put myself in the, you know, the, in the, the position of someone wanting to consider using this thing either to build a backend or to, um, or to use, you know, somebody else's backend that, that sits behind this API. And I want to say, I mean, my, my fundamental reason for coming here is I want to use the Kubernetes API against a non Kubernetes uh, container orchestrator. That's, that's, the, the fundamental premise here. And my first question is going to be of the functionality and of the API in Kubernetes, which parts of it are going to work correctly and which parts of it should I either not use or I need to relearn how they use because they work differently. And if I look at that page that was up on the screen a moment ago, it doesn't cover any of that. Uh, it covers uh, a bunch of Azure Container Service features that are or are not accessible through this, if I understood correctly. So that that's the fundamental question. And, and I, I, I'm not suggesting that the answer has to be 100% of Kubernetes works, but I need to be able to find out what works and what doesn't work. And I don't seem to have a way of doing that yet. The conformance tests are some way towards that, but they actually, and this is not the fault of this project, this is the fault of the conformance tests. The coverage of them is so low 
that it actually doesn't give you a good uh, a good answer there. Um, and and the, and the documentation that we had in front of us doesn't begin to answer that question either. Um, so that's that's what I'm suggesting we need here. It sounds like to me that you, yeah, uh, you want more stringent documentation, but without, uh, uh, so exact uh, API level, just so I understand, API level uh, documentation of what features don't work when you create a pod, when you create a daemon set, or when you create a specify node affinity or something like that. Uh, is that correct? I'm, I'm not arguing that we're not detailed enough. I'm arguing that we don't have any. So if you pull up that page that was in front of us a few minutes ago. Can I share my screen actually? Uh, would that be okay? Because I can show you the sure. read from our... I think unfortunately we're out of time now. So we, we I think we might have to uh, do some offline follow-up here. Um, uh, I hope, and, and yeah, we, we didn't get onto the rest of the agenda, unfortunately. Um, but I think this was important. Uh, hopefully it was educational to everybody. Um, and uh, yeah, let, let's perhaps take this offline. I don't know if we want to, can we wait two weeks before we continue the conversation or um, should we schedule something uh, separate from the next meeting? Ricardo, what do you think? Ryan? Yeah, we might be able to schedule something next week uh, around the same time, uh, Thursday at uh, 8, 8 a.m. Uh, Pacific time. Does that sound good to you guys? Or? Yeah. Yeah. And I'll try and get, yeah. Sh um, do you want us to start to try and write up that documentation within the week? Because I think that's the biggest point of um, discussion. Yeah. yeah. OK. Yeah, definitely. We will. Um, we will start that. Um, and we'll see if that kind of looks like what you guys are expecting um, and kind of go from there. And we'll keep. And just to be clear, this is the same thing Brian Grant requested, I believe, in like October. Yeah. So this is um, a new request. I think it's just the same request over again. <laughs> yeah, I, I agree with that. We were, I mean, we were doing, and that's why we're going through conformance testing right now, um, but for EODL. And the bigger question for, and that's like, I, I wanted, I didn't reply in that thread, but the bigger question for me was, does this like does this align with every single provider, um, and how is this going to be useful for anybody else? And if we can answer those questions, I am one hundred like I am happy to do the documentation, and and I'm sure it will be useful. So it's just a confusing part of like we have a core <laughs> and we have all these providers that have the ability to be so flexible. So it's hard to yeah. figure out like how conformance and he he asked for conformance specifically i think so that's why we were going through conformance yeah um, I mean, in, my, in my mind that you, you can conceptually create a table uh where you know down the left hand side is all the kubernetes features and across the top is all the existing providers okay. and you can say these providers support correctly support these features of the kubernetes api and there will probably be huge bands across that table where none of the providers do and those are actually cases arguably where the api cannot support those things today and mm -hmm. maybe we you know in future we could we could address those or maybe we just make it explicit that if you use a virtual kubelet uh, back end doesn't matter which one it is it isn't going to do the following things uh, i think that's you know conceptually what we're looking for okay um, uh, and then yes you know ideally be able to dig down into more detail and find out exactly like what does and doesn't work there. But at least at a, at a high level, uh, one needs to be able to understand what that table looks like. Okay. And it doesn't have to have every possible provider. It might just have three or five, you know, of the primary ones as an illustration. Mm -hmm. All righty. Yeah, we'll, we'll pick out three. Thank you so much for all you guys' this time. We really, really appreciate it. Yeah. All right, guys. Uh, yeah, time check is um, 9, 9 to 3 a.m. Um, yeah, so do you want to have this discussion two weeks from now again, or or you want to have it next week? So it's up to you guys. So um, we could do next week. I mean, got no plans. <laughs> I would suggest that we that we wait until we have that that documentation, or at least a table. Like yeah, if you can have it done in a week. That's great, but I, I don't want us to have the whole conversation over again without without that information. Yeah. So mm -hmm. let us know. Let us know. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. 
and then we, we didn't have time to do the the roadmap so i think uh if we schedule a meeting next week we might be able to talk about that and if not then we'll talk about it in in the next um you know uh whatever the two week um, cadence that we have does that make sense yeah i think let's push that out to two weeks uh, i don't want to exclude people from that conversation just because they couldn't make the um unusually yeah. scheduled one we, we'll the, the one in a week's time we can focus specifically on virtual kubelet i would suggest got it got it yeah all right anybody else has anything else uh, okay well thank you everybody we'll see you next time thank you for joining